Hello! Welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 28, The Hook. Games for catching new gamers. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to you. For you, not to you. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop for you to join in the show. I don't think we need to re-record that, even though I messed it up. Nah, it's, it's probably, the, I think it's the first time I've messed that up. <laughs> we love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Now we've been putting out a ton of new con content. Wow, yeah, I'm off today. We have been putting out a ton of new content. A lot of that is going right to YouTube. I want to know what you think. What have you liked? What didn't you like? Is it too much? What would you like to see? Feel free to let us know whether it's a technical comment about quality or something about the content itself. We can't improve if we don't know what needs improving. Heck, if you just want to geek out about the way we're doing things, that works too. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can check the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. Uh, this week, I've got some more Scoville, this time with an expansion. We tried something new in Gloomhaven, and I've got a game that was on the very bottom of the pile of shame finally played. And I've got a lot of Hogwarts battle. <laughs> this past Saturday, I hosted a game night at my place specifically to try to reduce those piles of shame as part of the Less Shame, More Game Challenge. Uh, there was an expansion I wanted to try, but the big thing I really wanted to do was get a game played that I have owned for far too long. That game is Shafosa. Now, I bought Shafosa back in 2015 when it was on sale for $6 on Amazon. Now, besides being a good deal, Z Garcia from the Dice Tower had talked about it on a recent show I had watched back then and noted how he really enjoyed it. Now, the reason this game has sat on my pile, or at the bottom of my pile, really, for so long is due to the rulebook. See, this is a Swedish game, and I don't know what language the rules were originally published and written in, but man, it was not English. In the box are various rule books in a variety of languages and one leaflet. The leaflet indicates that it's the family rules and very clearly states, play this first for your first game. The problem is that over three years, despite trying multiple times, I've never managed to figure out those family rules. So I want to know what the Swedish version of English is. Is it Swedish? <laughs> Swedish. Uh, <laughs> seriously, though, for many gamers trying new things, it can be a real problem to deal with the foreign or poorly translated instructions that show up in a lot of these uh, imports. And while BGG is there to help, finding the right help buried in some obscure mm -hmm. forum can be problematic. Not only that, you get a game that's this old and obscure. Well, I guess it's not that old. It's from like 2012. There's nothing on Board Game Geek. Like I, I wasn't the only person who bought this game for six bucks and couldn't figure it out because no one's talking about it. I, I was looking for an FAQ or a uh, rule summary sheet or something, and there was nothing. But I was determined this time. I'm going to play this silly game. This is, it's been, a, it's shameful, right? Pile of shame. No, this is a game I really should feel bad that I bought, even if it only cost me six bucks. It sat there too long. I'm like, I got to get it done. So I gave it another go. So like I said, I Googled it and I found nothing, which is just weird because there's nothing. There's no how to play videos. There's no updated rule book. There's not even an FAQ out there. There are a couple board game geek threads on some very specific rule questions, but that's about it. So I'm like, all right, fine. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to set the game up in front of me. And I'm going to take out the family rules. I'm going to figure it out. So I sat there and no, the, the family rules just don't make sense. It's like, do this. And you're like, what is it talking about? It, it, I'm like, all right, we're going to play this game. So 
in the book are these thicker rule books called the Geek Rules, and I expect this to be like the the heavy version, the the hard version of the game. So I sat through and read the Greek for Geek version, not Greek, but it, the first book was more like Greek than this one. I sat down and read through the Geek version of the rules, and you know what? It basically kind of mostly made sense. It definitely helped me understand the family rules. Now, the family rules as written are incomplete and missing a lot of the core concept of the games, which are fully explained in the geek rules, like what mines do for you and why you want to build buildings. I actually figured, why not just give up on the family rules completely and jump right to the geek rules? And if I had done that three years ago, we would have played this game. Now, I got to admit, the geek rules are still in really broken English. Um, it's obviously someone just put it through a Google Translate. Like, I don't think they paid anyone to localize this. If they did, that person should be fired. Um, it, I, it took a few passes. Uh, even when we were playing, we were handing around the rulebook going, here, read this. Do you think this means what I think it means? And coming up with an agreement on it. Well, it's a step up from Masters of the Universe yeah. then at this point. But what was it like once you actually got playing? I, surprisingly good for what it was. Now that's what it is. Like it's this is the thing about Shafausa. You look at this box and you see these fantasy races, obviously in a tavern, looking over a world map. If I remember, there's like a dagger stuck into the tavern, the, the table. You open it up, and the first thing on top is a big fold-out RPG-style map. You look at the player boards with all these different types of terrain and stops to, spots to build stuff, and you would 100% think this is a fantasy 4X-style game where trolls and elves are going to be battling for land. What you don't expect is a game about trolls and elves talking currency and doing stock market speculation. That's right. Shafausa is a pure ac economic game with a fantasy veneer. So I can picture elves, but I'm sorry. Fiscally responsible trolls is a step too far for my brain. No, then that's exactly it. That's the problem. Like uh, Deanna was playing the trolls. She had a race of trolls. One of her special abilities were the trolls could eat rocks. And they had this awesome picture of trolls devouring rocks. But all it actually meant is she could get copper cheaper. Like it's, it's weird. It, it, it's so far from the theme. Now I got to say, as an economic game, it's solid. It's it's rather good. But I can't think of anything else in my collection that has a further disconnect between the art and theme and the gameplay. Like, it, it's way out there. Now, I'm not going to go into the full game mechanics here or how to play. You can read all that as part of the full review over on the blog. I will just say that Shafausa is an asymmetric economic engine building game. Players are building mines and buildings, expanding their territory, managing seven different resources ranging on a scale from wood to gold and engaging in market speculation for those seven different goods markets. Now, one last note on production quality. This is a total mixed bag. This is also, there's a disconnect here because on one hand, the game actually comes with excellent little seven plastic trays with lids for all the resources. And so everything has a place and a place to put it and I don't need to even grab my wooden bowls. But it also has some of the thinnest cardboard I've ever seen in a board game, which I swear is just thick card laminated. And whatever it's laminated with is this thin plastic that's already starting to peel on some of the pieces. Then the last problem is everything is dark. Way, way too dark. All the graphics are too dark. Like they sent this game to the printer and they had the gamma set wrong. It's so dark that parts of the boards and chits can't be read from across the table. And through the game, Enchi Games had to keep asking us what the price of wood was every turn. Now, I got to say, if you dig a game where you're going to increase the price of ore by exactly $2 so that next turn you can sell your three spare ore to give you exactly $20 that you need to build that coal furnace so that next turn you can build your first copper mine, if that sounds like fun to you, you'll probably dig Shafauza. Now, if you want trolls backing orcs while the humans are trying to develop catapults to capture the lands of the elves, you're going to have to find a different game. Well, it's interesting, but it sounds like it really only appeals to a pretty narrow band of gamers, uh, Lord of the Rings style enthusiasts who want more economic reality in their fantasy gaming. 
Yeah, I think in general, though, like I, I don't even know if this would appeal to Lord of the Rings fans. Like, just toss out the theme. Like, throw it out. Assume this game has no theme. Just think of it as an economic engine builder with seven resources and a market for each resource. Like, I get flashbacks to going to Origins and going to the Mayfair booth and playing this game called King Chocolate. Now, this is supposedly a game about making chocolate bars. A unique theme. I'd never seen a chocolate bar making game before. So when we sat down at Origins, this guy from... Mayfair sits down to do the game demo and he starts telling us about how we're building toilets. And the first step to build a toilet is to get the ceramic. And the next step is you have to attach the plunger. And we're like, whoa, what, what, what are you doing? Why are you talking about toilets? Isn't this a game about building chocolates? And he used that to point out just how abstract this game is and how it could be anything that takes six steps to build, which he decided to pick a toilet because obviously that's going to get people to buy your game. But anyway, that's that's what Shafausa feels like, except it's the same deal, but instead you're dealing with seven markets instead of six steps. It, it could be anything. It could be Splendor, where you're acquiring, setting up trading posts and trading seven different types of gems. Like the, the theme is at worst misleading and be at best easy to ignore. But the game is solid. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> at least it's off the pile of shame now. That's true. Uh, now, for me this week, with uh, a few extra school days off for weather and a uh, PD day thrown in there, we got in a bunch of Hogwarts Battle with the Family. And I'm very happy to say, for those who have been following along, we finally made it through Book 5. It was still a bit of a slog, but it was a definitive win and no extreme playing. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. It's amazing how much easier games are when you don't play by the extreme rules. Uh, something I know very well and got reminded of this past week, but we'll get to that later. Now, it was actually the first game of the week that got through book five. Uh, interestingly, after book five, we found book and six and seven almost too easy. Huh. Uh, we beat them both first try. They weren't effortless, but as the game evolved, there was a specific adjustment, uh, much like the specific adjustment that made game five uh, as difficult as it was. Um, that same adjustment got changed again, and okay. I find that made it a little bit easier again. So it's it's an odd, it was an odd choice uh, to make you know to do what they did. Um, now, once we beat book seven, though, we still weren't done as we had picked up the monster box of monsters along with the game, and that gives you four more boxes or games or or decks to unpack as you go along. Uh, that bring in new mechanics and even a new player character, uh, as well as the initial Hermione, Ron, Neville, and Harry, the Monster Box of Monsters gives you Luna to play with. Uh, and the only the only real change you need to do is you need to take the Luna character out of the Hogwarts deck. So uh, hardly uh, har hardly difficult. And uh, what I'm not sure about is whether or not you can play you can switch into a five player uh, mode. I haven't actually looked into that, but. Oh. Uh, if you can, that would uh, be really interesting and might actually make things <laughs> easier because what we weren't expecting was the difficulty. Uh, we got, we've gone through it three times now and have been absolutely slammed. Um, we haven't beaten more than a couple of villains uh, and there's actually seven, eight opponents to get through mm. and, uh, and two is our best. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting that the first game spikes part way through in difficulty. Yeah. I've seen enough people complain that book five is hard, but I, I like you, I hadn't heard much about six and seven. Yeah. I've so I do have a question though. Now that you've beaten the original box, is there any reason to go back and play that? Is there enough stuff there to keep you and potentially more importantly the kids interested, or is it kind of now you're done with the box and it's time to move on to the expansion? No, I think we would probably still play because there's enough ways to mix it up between... I mean, we're only playing three, the three of us, so we've mm -hmm. got the ability to rotate player characters around and, and play with different characters. Uh, there's skill sets that you can change up. Uh, and once, you get, once, you're, once you're done the game and you go into that full game mode, uh, there's actually rules for randomizing the villain uh, oh, okay. ro uh, rollout. Um, and so I would, ab I would absolutely play it again. I don't know how long it would stay, uh, stay fresh, but it's definitely got uh, some, some more table time to it before uh, we're sick of it. Oh, that's cool. It's good to hear. 
So the other thing I got off my pile of shame Saturday was the Scoville Labs expansion for Scoville. Now, I've been itching to get to this one to the table after playing Scoville at the birthday bash. Plus, I just wanted to play more Scoville because, as I mentioned when talking about that, it was way more fun than I remembered. And I remembered it as being pretty good. Now, the Labs, to me, is an expansion in two parts. The first part is just more of what you loved. More market cards, more chili recipes, and more peppers. Lots, lots more peppers. One of the complaints about the original game is that Tasty Minstrel Games didn't include enough peppers in the game. They obviously heard this complaint as the expansion has a bunch more peppers. And not just peppers, but also tokens for tracking even more peppers. Little chits with threes and fives on them. As for the market cards, they do add one additional rule. Some of them have extra actions on them. Now, these are the same as the extra action tokens that come in the base game. You, you get them for fulfilling the market order, and then you can later turn them in for that bonus action but lose any points. So they basically work the same. At this point, I don't see any reason not to always use this stuff every game of Scoville I play going forward. It just adds more to the same without changing the feeling of the game at all. We threw some of these extras in when we played we, uh, the week previous, uh, and even with a full complement of players, we didn't have any concerns with running out of peppers, which was a nice improvement. Yeah, way back in the day, I remember having to take out some of the auction cards and give them to people so they could track their peppers. It's good to see that's uh, gone from the game. Yeah. Now, the big thing Scoville Labs adds is the lab part, the, the lab. Each player now gets their own little personal pepper planting lab. It's a little three-by-three three grid with spots for nine peppers. And each planting phase, in addition to planting on the main field, you can plant one pepper in your lab. And when you plant the pepper in the lab, it crossbreeds with any adjacent peppers. The other thing the lab does, which besides just giving you better opportunity to grow peppers you need, is when you sell peppers. Now the money you get for selling is based on the peppers in your lab as well as on the board, which has a neat additional effect of making it so the market value of peppers can now be different for each player. Well, still not a heavy game. The additional economic effect uh, of the lab is nice and an unexpected yeah. touch. I, I assumed that it was just going to cost you something in some way in order to breed peppers locally um, and more breed, breed something more easily that you, you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Um, yeah. Uh, so to, to see that it has additional effects beyond that is, is, uh, nice and interesting. Yeah. I thought it was really cool. Uh, the other one I found is with three players, it felt way heavier. There was way more AP. I think with three players, it's a lot easier to see what the other players are doing. So you're more aware of, Ooh, he's collecting black peppers. He's probably going for this recipe. Whereas I found with six players, it was just too much to track. So I didn't track any of it. There was also so that, the problem. There was also the problem that the the pepper map spread out so much that you just couldn't get some places. Yes, there was just no way to get if you if you made a choice to go right at the beginning, and someone else went left and started building in that way, you weren't going to get there. Yeah, uh, which is where the lab would come in because right. then you could breathe those preppers that were on the other side. Now, overall, I say I like the lab. I like the lab a lot. I personally think I'll, I'll just use it every time. But my friend Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, did not like the lab. He actually found it added a layer of complexity to the game that wasn't needed, and he found it distracting. That he, There was stuff he wanted to focus on. He's like, oh, yeah, i got to do the stupid lab thing. And he actually found the game felt less tight, more loose. Uh, it was too easy for some players to get peppers. Like, oh, I got the one ghost pepper. Oh, then you just went and bred mud on your lab. Yay, I'm so glad I did all that work. So I, I get it. I understand that he didn't, uh, didn't like it. So uh, as for Scoville Labs going, personally, I'm going to toss in everything but the lab. Everything, all the other stuff's going in. All the new market cards, all the new recipes, obviously the extra peppers. Why wouldn't you? That'd be kind of weird to sort out. But anyway, I'm going to throw everything in. Then I'm going to sit there and, and pull the table, right? I'm like, hey, here's what the lab does. Do you guys want to use it or not? Because you know what? It didn't make the game amazingly better. I just liked it. So I could play without it and feel fine. Plus, it didn't ruin the game for Sean. It just, he'd rather play without it. So in general, if people want to use it, we'll use it. And if people don't want to use it, we'll leave it out. And I think that actually makes for a strong expansion. Uh, it's something that expands mm -hmm. and improves the game on one hand, but also has that option to change the, the game even more or just leave out that part, but still mm -hmm. get all that benefit from the extras. Um, if you're looking for something less brainy, leave out the labs. And if you want that extra oomph and, and you want that extra um, thought process to happen, then you can leave it in. As for me, the rest of my week was just the usual board game arena fair with uh, more Takedo, Seven Wonders, and a little bit of Race for the Galaxy. 
No more uh, Libertalia for you? You finally nope, got out I, of that uh, loop? <laughs> no, I, I did not jump back into that once we, once it ended. <laughs> we should play that local just so you can see that it can be a decent game because I feel bad talking so bad about the game because it can be okay. No, just... I, I, I'm i fully, I'm willing to admit that the board game arena version of Libertalia does not suit me. Whether no, or not the I... game itself is fine, different story. Yeah, I totally agree. So on to our Gloomhaven recap, where we decided what we're going to do when we're short a player. So this week, Deanna was not feeling well and had a bad cough, a uh, really bad cough, something that would have probably been rather bad for live streaming. So we sat down and debated what to do. We didn't really want to cancel. Now that we're streaming every Friday, like I feel obligated to be here, right? I'm here on Wednesday with a bad voice, right? I feel an obligation to you people watching and those of you listening on the podcast and everything else. Well, I, no, no podcast for Gloomhaven. But anyway, those of you watching our Gloomhaven game, whether that's on YouTube or live, I want to make sure we're there, especially when we're supposed to be streaming on uh, Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So we need to do something. We had to stream something. So do we stream something else? Do we play without Deanna, or do we try one of the options in Gloomhaven? I figured streaming some Gloomhaven was better than something else, because we advertise and tell everyone, hey, Friday, come watch us play Gloomhaven, and then you show up and we're playing Catan, and you're going to be like, hey, what's this? I thought you were going to play Gloomhaven. So I dug out the core rule book for Gloomhaven, because I knew there were some other options besides playing campaign games, which is pretty cool, is there are actually more than I expected. Like, rereading through the book, I'm like, I basically had three other options. So one was to start a new party. Now, this is something you can do at any time, and I think it's fantastic for groups that can't get the same people together every session. You just each pick some characters out of the ones you've unlocked so far, which is six to start. You grab a new party sheet, you find one of the spots on the map, and you go, and you do that adventure. Now, some scenarios do require that your party has hit certain achievements, which is for storyline reasons, right? You can't go finish our mission. You can't do the fallout thing. Um, but there aren't. Most missions didn't seem to have a lot of restrictions. Now, the problem we had was we played four of the six starting characters, but haven't unlocked any new ones. So for three of us playing Friday, someone was going to have to take what's basically someone else's character, right? An already existing character someone else is playing. Now, you can do this. Like, it works in the rules, but it's kind of a pain. Each character has this box where you tuck all your stuff in, and each of us playing has our own box, and we have it set up kind of how we want, right? So we have the cards sorted, so we know which of our what our characters have and don't. Our combat decks have been adjusted for our perks. We have all our items in the box. So if we were to swap up who's using the character components, we'd have to reset that every game. So... Yes, there's a character sheet for tracking this stuff, but literally you just have to write down everything and then go find the cards every time. Like, if we had had three new character classes we could have tried, we might have gone with this option, but the whole swapping characters back and forth between sessions, just we decided to pass on this. Yeah, it's interesting that they chose on a, on a one to four player game to have six starter characters. Like, I understand you can unlock more, <laughs> But it, it's a game that's specifically designed to have the ability to have multiple groups and things, but you can't have two full groups until you've played for a certain period of time. Although you can have two full groups at the recommended player count of three. That's true, I suppose. <laughs> it's yet again reinforcing that if you play Gloomhaven, it really seems like uh, the designer wanted you to play with a group of three players. Yeah. That That just seems to reinforce that. So our next option is to keep playing. Just continue the game without Deanna's character. There's nothing stopping you in Gloomhaven from doing this, right? Like, there's there's no special rules if you're missing a character. The rules actually adopt the number of players based on that, and they adjust the levels and the number of monsters, if you remember to do it. There's nothing that says you have to have all four of the same characters there every time. Uh, just, that doesn't seem fair, right? Like, oh, sorry, you're sick. We're going to play without you. Have fun. And then the next week, like, oh, you missed this awesome thing that happened. No, that would kind of suck, right? Deanna's going to feel like she missed out on, on what we, if we had continued the campaign. You know, games, uh, RPGs especially, always leave room for this sort of option. But it's so rare that you actually want to do that to someone. And, like, you know, unless you've got a party member who's just a casual party member and mm -hmm. they're not there all the time. Uh, skipping actual campaign from a with a regular player is just kind of horrible. Yeah, it's bad. 
it, it, especially when you we do have a regular group, right? Like it's not like Deanna only plays every couple of weeks. So the next thing I looked into is what the rules call casual play. This is where you take your existing characters, pick a spot on the map, either something we've already completed or something new, and play through the scenario with one change. Everything plays the same except you never do the conclusion of the scenario. So you get the gold, you get the XP, but you're not going to progress the plot or unlock anything new. Now, this does seem like an interesting way to play the game. It seems like a great way to replay a mission. If there was a mission you guys or anyone really enjoyed, it's a way to do it. But I got to say, similar to the last one, trying something new seems like it's just going to be a spoiler. Like, we're going to go somewhere new, we're going to see what's there, but then we're going to return there as the campaign. Besides Deanna missing out on it for the first time, when we do go as the campaign, it's going to feel like cheating, right? So we discussed this option. Uh, we specifically talked about going back to the Windswept Highlands. That was the one adventure we had a real hard time on the first time to give it another go. But we decided against this version to play as well. Yeah, much like advancing without a character, the missing out feeling is still there. Yeah. Right? Like it's... So this leads us to the final option. Sorry, I guess we're four. I said three earlier. Uh, there are rules at the very back of Gloomhaven. It's one of the last things in the rule book for how to generate a random dungeon. In this method, you take two decks of cards and you use those to generate a three-room dungeon, complete with monsters, hazards, obstacles, traps, and treasure. The goal is to defeat all the monsters you find. Your characters get to keep any treasure they find, and they get standard scenario XP based on your party difficulty. I got to say, this seemed like the perfect option for us. We get to play, we get the stream, we get to check out some new rules for the game and experience Gloomhaven in an all new way. We don't end up spoiling anything, not only for the people watching the stream, but Deanna doesn't miss out on anything herself. So this is what we went with. Now the rules for random dungeons are pretty simple. You don't travel, so you don't get to draw a road card. When you get to the dungeon, you're just going to flip over a room card and a monster card. And the two kind of combine to give you an encounter. And you can read the names off the top for where you are. So you can have the Cursed Tunnel or the Infested Caves. Now, there are a lot of these cards. And like the cra there's a crazy number of possible combinations between these. I didn't count how many. But I'm going to say 25 to 40 card decks somewhere in there. They look like old magic decks. Now, the room card tells you what room tile to use. Makes sense. And where to place the exit. And what overlay tiles go on the board. So these are your obstacles and hazards. The monster board, not only get, or card, sorry, monster card, not only gives you what monsters are in the room, but also any traps, treasure, and obstacles. Now you only draw one room at a time, so you don't know what's coming until you open the door. And then to make things escalate as the mission goes on, every time you open the next room, something bad happens. Now these are on the room cards. It's going to be, there's two negative effects happens. When you get to room two, the top negative effect happens. When you get to room three, both negative effect happens. So they're not making this a nice casual oh. stroll through the dungeon. They're planning for this to be a slog. Yeah, and it escalates. It gets harder, which in Gloomhaven, as you get further in the game, you have less cards to work with. So knowing that things are going to escalate is big. Like, that's something we may not have done great, where we expended a lot of resources in the first room. At least one character did. Overall, it went well. I got to say straight up, I liked playing Gloomhaven this way. I liked the fact that it wasn't a storyline and a scenario, and it was just all about skill like it was all about us playing well to defeat monsters there were no funky rules it was just straight up battle uh it was a lot of fun just bashing the monsters and watching them drop tons of loot like it felt like playing diablo it really did like room full of monsters loot everywhere on the ground treasure chests in the corner uh we got to fight some stuff we'd never fought before so that was cool and we got to try the game with three players being brave, we even played at normal difficulty, which is level two for our particular group. And we did surprisingly well. We got down to just one enemy left, and it ends up we were playing the extreme version. Of course, the extreme version. This was our first time using these rules, so we had to mess something up. Or I should say I had to mess something up. Now, for me, watching the stream live on Friday... <laughs> This this discovery was kind of a highlight you know, in a kind of almost cruel way, I suppose. Uh, but I, unfortunately, you do kind of need to be invested in the entire adventure. Uh, so just highlighting it and as a clip didn't really seem to do it. But if you want to, Thursday, when the video drops in the YouTube channel, uh, you will be able to watch it if you'd like and, uh, and have that same effect if you follow through. Yeah, yeah. Watch me screw up. Watch me. 
uh, go through the entire adventure being so used to playing with four players that every time I spawn monsters, I spawned it for a full group of four. Uh, this meant we faced way more ops opposition than we should have. Uh, Tori is the one that noticed this, probably because he was exhausted and knocked out early in the match. Uh, so he had time to kill. And we he noticed it when we spawned room three. He's like, wait a minute, what do those colors on the card mean? So we played wrong and made it way, way harder on ourselves. But I got to say, the fact we came so darn close to winning is a real accomplishment. Like, I, I felt like we accomplished something. To, to the fact that we heavily debated giving ourselves the full XP. But we decided not to. We're like, I, I think it's because we were on stream as part of it. I'm like, I feel accountable. People are watching. We can't cheat. Even though I still think we earned it. But we, we just took our, our XP for using our cards and our treasure we managed to pick up and did not take any of the rewards for completing the dungeon. One monster, 10 hit points, was all that separated you from victory in extreme mode play. Yeah, it, it was so close. Like, oh, that's, I'm frustrated with myself for messing that up and not noticing it sooner. Like, we, we expended so many resources in that front room on a stupid bear that wouldn't have even been there if I just spawned the right monsters. But overall, Gloomhaven random dungeons, great way to play. Like, seriously, if I this now makes me more willing to bring the game out to the game store. Like, I have friends like Sean Hamilton, who isn't part of our group, who wants to try it. I now see a very valid way to show off Gloomhaven without spoiling anything for anyone. Except for maybe the fact that he'll see some character cards ahead of time. But when you open the pack, you get to look through all the cards. So this is going to be your go-to even when you unlock more characters? I think so. Like, I'm tempted with the more characters. If I unlock more characters, I think it might be when I actually start a second group of Gloomhaven. Or we might make a second party with three characters just in case someone's short. But I really like this random dungeon. I think part of it is the fact we failed with only 10 hit points left. I'm like, oh, I want to try again. Of course, it'll be different cards. I don't want to try the exact same dungeon. Right. But I think this will be the plan. Like, if I'm not available Friday, I'm pretty sure Kat, Tori, and Deanna could very easily go through a random dungeon on their own. Or if Kat's not available. The nice part about that is is good is is we can do it now if we did unlock more characters that's that's where the problem has right so besides the fear of missing out what do you do when it's me missing this week and then next week it's deanna missing then next week it's tori missing what are we going to make nine different parties with every possible group of three different player classes right. uh, what if next week it's just tori and i do we make another party so i don't think so i think i think we're going to stick to random dungeons Solo, time for the less shame, more game pile of shame update. It took an entire night dedicated to it, but I was able to get two games off the pile. The oldest game that has been in my pile of shame for the longest, Shafosa and the Scoville Labs expansion. The Done. pile of shame. All right, so we're down to 74 on the pile of shame now. Getting there. Tomorrow on Thursday, for those of you watching live, tomorrow live, I will be updating a blog post which will give an overall update of where we stand. I realize it keeps going down on the show, but we're not accounting for any new games I've gotten here. So there may be a bump up. That'll be in next week's podcast. We'll discuss where we stand. On the blog, I will be doing a short review of each of the games that are new to my table in January. So look forward to that tomorrow. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that sometimes ma that make it onto, up onto YouTube. Well, thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight in the chat, we have Matt M on Gaming. There's a new cool. game I haven't seen before. Shadzar, uh, Tech2674. Uh, we've got uh, Twiniac CZ, nice Virgo Pro Z, uh, Piolizai, which may or may not be a bot. That one I'm not sure about. And Brian is here joining us again this week. Thank awesome. you very much, Brian. And I did see uh, um, uh, who else was in here earlier. We had we did have Teldern stop in. I don't know if he's still. Oh, that's uh, cool. He's probably still viewing and just dropped off the chat list. Oh, thanks everyone for stopping in. Yeah, Brian, you missed it. I talked all about it. So when you listen to the podcast episode, you get to hear all about Shafosa, the game that does not, it, it sells itself. It's a bait and switch. It looks like you're buying a 4X fantasy empire elves versus dwarves battle game. Instead, you're going to be worrying about the market price of ore and copper. 
Yep. So as usual in the chat, if you have anything, questions or anything you wish to comment, we will be checking back in multiple times during the show to see how things are going and to answer your questions. Oh, and Poncho is here. Cool. I, it's hilarious. What I've got two different chat lists open. Nah, they both knows? show me different names, and Poncho72 isn't even one of them. But thank you for being here for us. <laughs> there you go. I, I have a huge list. I've got like 15 people showing for some reason today. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't try to figure it out. But yeah, Shafaz is a good game. I noticed Angie Games noted it. She is more than happy to play it again. I, I do want to give it another show. Try it. We did try it with Sean Hamilton. Sean Hamilton thought it was okay. It, <laughs> it's, it was okay. It wasn't great. I personally, it was one of those games where, you know, I went to bed at night and I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh, I could have done this or I should have done that. I, it's solid. It's just not at all what you expect it to be. And just take those family rules and rip them up because, wow, like. Three years of sitting on my pile because I thought I'd never figure the game out. And all it took was, excuse me, reading the advanced rules before the basic rules. Right. Uh, you get the notes back up. Give me a second. <laughs> Here we go. We are growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, rev rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. That's interesting. No, Poncho just noted that he's watching through Xbox. Maybe they don't show up on the list because oh. they're, they're not on my list either. Could Welcome be. either way. Xbox, PlayStation, we, we'll take all viewers from everywhere. Absolutely. Sign and, up. Yeah, he does He does show up in my chatty list now. For I guess he just had to yeah, talk Maybe there's some lag or something. It could just be he had to talk. So, Cool enough. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, YouTube videos, reviews, unboxings, anything else we create. And heck, man, we are creating a lot of stuff, especially this last week. It was nuts. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Breakout Con, coming up quick, March 15th to 17th. All three of us, all the entire Tabletop Bellhop team will be there. This is a fantastic gaming convention that features all forms of gaming, RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, and a fantastic board game room with a huge game library and so many different visitors with so many different topics oh my God, going on. Yes. They are doing lectures and, well, lectures and, and breakouts and groups and, and, and discussions all day, every day. Yeah, it's insane. The, the guest list is insane. Now, personally, I'm looking forward to some RPGs. I don't get a lot of RPG playtime in. Generally, I only play at cons. So I'm looking forward to Tales from the Loop, Dungeon World, and a game of High Plains Samurai. Yeah, and I, I went through, and I think there's only about four of the different uh, oh, breakout rooms and lectures uh, conference topics that I don't want to be at. So I'm going <laughs> to nice. be spending a lot of time uh, just enjoying uh, what other people have to say about gaming. Excellent. So, hey, designers, publishers, writers, artists, creators, creatives, let us promote your thing. We want to talk about your stuff here on the show. We are looking for advertisers. We're looking to do 30-second mid-show si segments for the podcast in all its forms, live, YouTube, and audio. And we're looking for sidebar ads for the website. If you're interested in this, getting it in touch, ooh. if you're interested, fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. I don't know what happened there. That would be... uh. Back in our New Year's episode, I talked about a few different gaming resolutions. One, of course, was the Less Shame War Game Challenge, where I won trying to play all of my unplayed games. So far, progress on that is going pretty well. Now, another challenge I've taken up is something called RPG a Month. The actual challenge is to read at least one new RPG item mm -hmm. a month with the goal being to get some of those, uh, get some use out of those games that are sitting on your shelves or hard drives gathering dust. Yeah, this was something started by Roger Braslett a few years back on Google+, and something I've been trying to keep going in the years since. Roger has taken part a couple of years, but he hasn't been as actively involved and kind of passed me the ball and said, hey, if you want to do it, run with it. While I didn't do so great last year with all the stuff going on in my home life and problems with my aging parents, as well as launching this whole bellhop thing, things seem to have settled down quite a bit so far in 2019, and things seem normal, I guess. Uh, I figured it was time to rededicate myself to this challenge again. 
So the first game for RPG a month in 2019 for me is Shadowrun, the 5th edition beginner box. Originally published in 2015, the Shadowrun Beginner Box claims to be the easiest way to get involved in the intrigue, grit, and action of one of the most enduring role-playing settings of all time. Now, most enduring, I gotta say that's a great word to put on the back of that box, because Shadowrun has been around since 1989. It's one of those role-playing games that pretty much everyone has heard of, and most people have actually played and tried at one point. Like, it's one of the classics. It's up there with Dungeons & Dragons, Cyberpunk, and Rifts. It's a game that's still going strong today, and it's also a game somehow in all these years I never played. Now, putting on my grumpy old man hat here, elves do not belong in a game with net running. I, I got to admit, back in the day, I, I felt the same. I was completely opposed to the concept of Shadowrun. I was a Cyberpunk 2020 fan through and through, and I didn't want any stinking elves and dragons in my dystopian future games. Over the years, though, I have met so many fans of this game, and the fact the game's still out there and still being played and still going says to me there's got to be something here that the fans like. So when they announced a new 5th edition was going to come out, I was a little excited, but then they announced an intro box set, and I am a huge fan of RPG box sets. I love them. They're, they're my favorite way to play a game is to crack one of those out with a new group and learn the game together. So I decided this was my chance to finally give Shadowrun a chance. Now, you're, you're more open to experiences <laughs> than I am then. <laughs> <laughs> that must be it. Sean's like, no way. I'm still, still no elves. But only if we all play humans. <laughs> So I read through the box. I took it apart. I basically dissected it and wrote up a rather extensive detailed read review of this box set over on the blog. There's enough in it and stuff to talk about. I could spend an entire episode itself just talking about Shadowrun, and I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm just going to give you a very short overview on my thoughts on this box and direct you over to the blog to read more if you're interested. TabletopBellhop.com, click on reviews and scroll down a little bit. You won't be able to miss this one. Yeah. So the box itself comes with five pre-generated characters, an extra long character dossier for one of those characters. Don't ask me why one of five. Uh, 24 page background and setting book, the actual quick start rules, which clock in at 31 pages, 12 blue D6, and a short excerpt from a Shadowrun novel. Everything looks great. Glossy paper, good quality, full color, lots of art. Text is well laid out, easy to read, and there are tons of examples. The problem I had, though, was the order the information is presented. So there is a sheet that tells you the order to read things, right? Or read me first. And if you follow that, it doesn't work. You're going to get to a section, uh, specifically in that character dossier, that tells you to do a solo adventure and roll some dice and check how many hits you had. Nowhere does it tell you how to figure out what a hit is. Uh, there's other issues like this. Like there's large sections of the character sheets that are never explained. The included module, as far as I can tell, is either copy pasted from a previous edition of the game or from the core rulebook and has stuff mentioned in it that is never mentioned anywhere else in this beginner box. Well, for a beginner box, it sounds like if you don't know a good deal about RPGs, you could really easily get lost in the weeds uh, out of what is bad layout design. That is true. That, that, that's basically it, right? Like overall, it kind of feels like a Shadowrun box written by Shadowrun fans for existing Shadowrun fans that are either checking out 5th edition for the first time coming from 4th, or they're checking out 5th because they haven't played 1st first, first or 2nd edition. So I'm not sure. Like it just feels like it's it's this is the box for Shadowrun they've already sold the game right you're already a Shadowrun fan you pick this up it didn't feel like a good box set for people like me who are new to the setting and rules that said if the goal of the box is to make me want to play Shadowrun or look into it more it worked uh, the setting, I gotta say, seems kind of cool, despite what my teenage self may have thought. The whole idea of goblinization, that's eh, kind of neat. I, I can see it. The rules I, surprised me. They are way simpler than what I expected. Now, from what I understand, talking to fans on Twitter, they've significantly changed the rules for 5th edition. Like, it used to be a lot more complicated, and like, the game has a reputation for having a lot of crunch and I didn't find the rules in there were a lot of crunch. So 
basic system is add your stat to your skill, like you do in almost every RPG. Roll that many D6s and counts your fives and sixes. That's it. Fives and sixes are hits. If you get as many hits as the threshold set by the DM, which is usually only two, you succeed. When it's opposed, when there's opposition, it switches to opposed rules, and it's you both add your skill and stat, you both roll, whoever has the most hit succeeds. Like, I got to say, that's fairly elegant sounding for a game notorious for being crunchy. So while overall it's not the best intro box I've read, I think this is a good box for someone who's into RPGs, someone who knows how to DM, someone who's played many games, someone with some role-playing experience who's curious about Shadowrun. But man, if you are new to the hobby, if you listen to us for board games and are curious about RPGs, do not pick this box as a intro to role playing in general. So Mo really did go into a lot more details and both what's bad and good about this box over on the blog. So if you're curious at all, I recommend you go check out that full review. Now yeah, we're seeing uh, Poncho and Brian and Shadzar having a little chat air in the lobby. Uh, Shadzar was worried we were drifting too far into uh, role playing, but that was just a slight little diversion and we'll be back at board games momentarily. Well, we can check, change the category midstream. I wonder if that's something worth doing. Like we can do it with the bot, right? So we could switch it over to RPGs when we're talking RPGs and then back to board gaming. But I don't know. To me, I think you pick whatever your main topic is. And definitely this week, our main topic is board gaming. Yeah, it's whether or not we, we should be going over to that podcasting co- or that, you know, one of the other. Yeah, the talks. Like, I don't know. <clears throat> but. Uh... And uh, yeah, I'm not sure. That's Shadzar, not Shadzar was uh, was saying that uh, Shadowrun was pretty. F- uh, Poncho was saying Shadowrun was pretty fun on the Xbox 360, and elves were weak in the game. <laughs> that'd be. And I would like to play an RPG where the elves suck because that's one thing I hate about elves. The whole reason elves are just way too popular and powerful in like every game that's ever been out. I don't know what it is. I, especially Merp was the worst. Warhammer, they were pretty bad. That, of course, they had the whole, you had to be good in Warhammer to try to balance that. Yeah, right. Yeah, the yeah. RPG a month stuff, I, I like that. That's awesome. Thanks for the bits, Brian. Yeah, Brian notes he loves the RPG a month stuff. Yeah, I'm going to try to keep that up. That The goal is once a month. Yeah. I, after reading Shadowrun, I don't know, I tried to set up a group to play the last Monday and actually play it. I don't know if I'll get that to the table. There's mixed feelings in the group whether they want to play it or not. Plus, if you read the full review... Wow, the included adventure has nothing to do with Shadowrun, which is really weird. And that included adventure just doesn't sound that great. Right. Moving on. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Well, the best way for your questions to get to us is to come to the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we're talking about games to hook new players into the world of hobby board games. Cat asked, what game would you introduce to people who aren't used to playing games? What's that one game that you have introduced to hook people? One game only, eh? What's the one game I would pick to introduce new play people to the hobby? Can anyone who listens to this show guess what game I'm going to say? Yeah, I'm pretty sure anyone who's a fan knows that's going to be Azul. Azul has so much going for it. It's eye-catching. It's tactile. The pieces want to be touched. They want to be picked up and admired. Colors are bright. They catch your attention. The player boards are well laid out, and they don't look complicated. The rule book isn't thick or wordy, and there's lots of pictures and examples. The actual rules are straightforward, easy to learn, and possibly, more importantly, rather easy to teach. Game time is in that sweet 20 to 40 minute spot where it's not quite a filler, but short enough, you often find yourself playing two or three games in a row. It's hard to say enough about Azul. For someone who's used to Monopoly and Scrabble, Azul is both easy to pick up, but also very enticing into the world of hobby games. Now, Kat asked for one game. I use to hook new gamers, but I don't use just one game. Yes, Azul is amazing and has near universal appeal, but it's not my only choice. I don't actually think there's one game that's perfect for everyone. So let's take a deeper look into this topic, right? 
We're going to take a look at what I think makes a good introductory game. Then after that, I'm going to give a list of 10 more games that I have actually used to hook new gamers. Games that I have introduced new players and had them hooked and looking to play more or coming back to future gaming events. So what makes a good introductory game? There are quite a few things to consider. And here are some of the things to look for at when picking a gateway game to show off potential new gamers. Mm -hmm. First up, easy to learn. Yeah, uh, we, we've got this first for a reason. Because unless you're sitting down with someone who's specifically asking to say, hey, I want to check out heavy war games. I want to be introduced to Columbia Block games. Or man, I am a huge Trekkie and I keep hearing about Starfleet battles. You want something simple. If they're looking for something in particular, give them that something in particular. But if you don't know that, you want to give them something easy to teach. Because one of the most intimidating things about our hobby is how complex people think the games are. Not how complex they necessarily are. People expect hobby bar board games to be hard. Hard to learn and hard to play and take a long time. You need to dispel that myth by presenting something that's very easy to learn. You want games with simple mechanics and relatively few interactions between those mechanics and rules that can be taught in minutes, not tens of minutes. Now, easy on its own isn't going to help if you can't express how easy it is as well. You need to be able to teach it. Yeah, there's nothing is going to turn off a new gamer more than you having to look up rules in a rule book. That's just going to reinforce that stereotype of, oh man, this is hard and intimidating. And wow, even you don't get it and you play all these games. When you're trying to get someone new into the hobby, you want to show off a game you know well. Something you're an expert at. Something you have taught successfully multiple times where you're not going to mess up any rules. You don't want to teach the extreme version. And please don't start referencing rule books, especially multiples. Okay, so you've got an easy game. You know how to teach it thoroughly. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to choose? Economic balance of the Roman Empire? Lumberjacks of Eastern Canada in the 18th century? Maybe instead try something exciting. I would totally play a Lumberjacks of Eastern Canada in the 18th century game, though. But again, you save that for gamers you already know. You want something that's exciting to play with lots of action. You want something that's going to catch people's attention uh, both the people playing and potentially people not playing. You want a game where all the players are engaged for the full game. Now, there's going to be plenty of time to introduce your new gamer friend to the world of Feld later. Right now, try to pick something that's going to grab them right away. Not only the game play, but the game physically. Eye candy really does make a difference to people new to the hobby. Uh, but do they care about it? If they love fantasy games, are you going to accidentally give them a robo rally? Yeah, or Shafosa, though it kind of looks like fantasy. But yeah, theme can be everything. Uh, Sean's mentioned it now, but multiple times on the show, how important theme can be. Uh, if you find something that this new gamer is interested in, whether that be a brand, a particular story, set of novels, a franchise, part of your work is done. If someone is obsessed with the wizarding world of Harry Potter, starting off with Harry Potter's Hogwarts battle is going to have a way better chance of hooking their interest than pulling out a dry abstract like Azul. Now, next up, is it a really a real game you're teaching them? If you're introducing someone to the wonders of cooking, you don't want to serve them fast food. Yeah, this is one that you don't where I don't necessarily agree with most of the other gateway gaming posts out there on the web and suggestions. I personally suggest avoiding filler games. You want the game you're playing to have an impact. What you really want is that new gamer to feel like the decisions they made made a difference in the game. You want them to have a feeling of accomplishing something, even if they don't win the game. This is why I avoid most of the party and family style games when trying to hook new gamers. While Flux can be a fun distraction and a great icebreaker with a new crowd, it's not the kind of thing that's going to get someone hooked on hobby games or talking about the games later or thinking about their strategies. You also need to think about interactions. Think about what it would be like to be that one player who's never played a hobby game yeah. suddenly facing off against some, you know, pros in a competitive game of Terraforming Mars. <laughs> Ooh, Terraforming Mars is an intro game. That's, that's a rough <laughs> one. See, this is where I find team and cooperative games are great for new gamers, especially shy ones or people intimidated by being in a new group. 
By removing any direct conflict between the players, which can be a turnoff to some players, playing with a team also gives the new player a support structure, other people around them that are there to help. And when you're playing a co-op, asking for help is encouraged, as is coaching, as opposed to a competitive game where you're not going to ask your opponents, what should I be doing? Now, co-op games are also great for shy players because they can play the game and kind of take a back seat. They can sit back and contribute as much as they want while still being part of a team. The only thing to watch for, though, with both team and cooperative games is quarterbacking, where you have an experienced player who's trying to tell the new player what to do, especially if they play their turn. Helping and guiding is good. Taking another player's turn for them is bad. Now, team games offer the same style of support system, right, where you have a team to help you through it, but you can still have competition. And some people, when playing games, only see it as a real game if there is some competition. So that's where the team games come in versus the cooperative. And if you want to step right outside the box they're used to, when they think of what a board game is and shake things up... This is where dexterity games come in, right? This, These are my favorites. I love using dexterity games to introduce new players to just how varied our hobby is. Like if you really want to show someone that not all tabletop games are Monopoly, throw a big yellow hamster wheel in front of them and throw some blocks down and teach them hamster roll. One of the great things about every dexterity game I have ever played or learned is they're easy to teach and learn. None of these games have complex rules or interactions. It's all simple actions. They tend to be rather accessible, and they don't require any special skills or knowledge to be able to play. The other thing that's neat is there's no rules mastery issues. So you can't get the thing where an old grognard who's played for years is necessarily better than a new player. With a dexterity game, you're all on common ground. Plus, dexterity games just look awesome, and they are great for drawing a crowd. This ain't your father's Jenga game. No, it is not. Though Jenga is still a solid dexterity game. I'm not going to discount Jenga. So those are the things I look for in a, 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 hot, a hook game, a, a catch, bait, a way to hook a new game. Now on to some specific game recommendations. Now, every one of these games is a game that has worked for me in the past. And no, you're not going to see the usual Catan, Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride that you find on every gate game list out on the web. I swear there's like one person that said it once and everyone just keeps parroting it. Not that these are bad games, and they're not even games I don't like. I just have never actually chosen them to introduce someone to the hobby. I personally think they're better options. A lot of it has to do with how people view the hobby. Uh, many people seem to think it can be a to be a board gamer means struggling with tough games and tons mm. of mechanics and deep thought. Uh, it can, and and that can be fun. But for every four X game, there's a dozen lighter games that are no mm -hmm. less of a hobby game than Gloomhaven is. Totally agree, and, and that's part of it is showing people the breadth of the hobby. So, game recommendation number one. These are going to be short. We're not doing full reviews of these. I'm just going to fire these off with a bit of info. Number one is King of Tokyo. This is Kaiju Yahtzee. You roll the dice three times, match symbols, get points, buy power-ups, and beat up other monsters. Game looks great, the theme draws people in, and it is dead simple to teach. We complained last week about reskinning Yahtzee being just, just that. Well, this mm -hmm. is the right way to take a game like Yahtzee and level it up for, somebody, for the hobby. Totally agree. Now here's one. This is one I call a hidden gem. This is a game called Black Fleet. This is a great looking pick up and deliver merchant ships and marauders, pirates, uh, Caribbean game. The components really kick this one up a notch. You got metal coins and plastic ships that are actually designed to hold the goods cubes you're moving around the board. This one catches people's attention. Now players not only play merchants, but are also playing pirates that harass the other players. It's a really simple card based gameplay that's easy to teach. And come on, everyone digs pirate themes. Except software pirates, that's not cool at all. No, and people who steal RPG PDFs, that's terrible, that's even worse. Steal your software. Paid creators. Now, I've suggested Red 7 before. This is a great small deck card game that is way more deep than it initially looks. At the end of your turn, you must be winning. If you aren't winning, play a card that means you are. And if that doesn't work, change the rules of the game. This one is great if you have traditional card game fans. This is a way to show them that there's more out there than 52 cards and bridge and poker and hearts. If they love Uno, this might blow their mind. 
Up next is Takanoko. This is another great one that gets people's attention. You've got bright hexagonal tiles with bright pieces of pink, yellow, and green bamboo rising out of them and being stacked up. And you have the cutest gardener and panda miniatures in this game I've ever seen. Now, the game itself is a pretty simple action selection game where you're basically working on set collection that I find really appeals to kids. There's enough here for adults by far. Like, this is definitely not a kid's game, though kids could enjoy it. And it was actually my daughter who bought me this game. And we've been playing it now on and off since she was eight years old. When the kids are picking it out, that really says something about accessibility, uh, but also about the wow factor on the table, because that's a lot of what mm -hmm. attracts, you know, the kids to the game is that is that eye-catching uh, factor. And that's what you want for new players. Up next, I've got King Domino. This is probably the most modern game on my list. This one's pretty new. Just, I think I just got it last year. This is a great gateway as everyone gets dominoes. Everyone at a young age is taught matching tiles. You draft tiles and play them in your personal play area, having to match at least one of the two sides. Tiles make up your kingdom, which is filled with fields, lakes, forests, etc. You're going to score points by having sets of similar terrain grouped together. I can teach this one in minutes. But it takes a couple plays to get good at the strategy of it, of knowing what to draft and getting everything to fit into your kingdom without having any gaps. You know, you start with something they know, people know dominoes, and it's an easy concept to grasp. And then before you know it, a few games in, they're cursing a misplaced lake and they're hooked. Yeah, oh, it's great for that. And and a good escalation. It's simple enough to get, but it's, it's that simple to get, um, simple to teach, difficult to master. It fits in there which is one of the sweet spots for these type of games. Now, I've mentioned this game multiple times. It seems like the last three to five podcasts in a row, I've been talking about Shadows Over Camelot. But you know what? It's for a good reason. I still think this is the best example of a co-op game with a hidden trader. Now, this one is the one you break out when you've got an RPG gamer who's curious about hobby board games. When your D&D player is like, hey, I can't, everyone's talking about board games. I want to check them out. This is the game I bring out. Each player plays the role of a knight of the round table, works to protect Camelot, and complete quests. The thing is, one of the knights may be a traitor working for the side of darkness, which really ties in some of that social deduction and interaction. Now, I do recommend for the first play game, play without the traitor to keep things simple. This was one of the early gateway games for me, uh, you know, far too long ago now, but... <laughs> which Sean was a role player, curious about board games back yeah. in the day. Now, my second big co-op recommendation isn't what most people would think. It is not Pandemic, which you will find on pretty much every other list. While I think Pandemic's good, it just doesn't have the impoint, impact that Flashpoint Fire Rescue does. In Flashpoint, you're playing firefighters. In this one, you're hoping to get players emotionally invested. You want to hook them by having them care about what's happening in the game. And I find people care way more about saving grandma from a burning bedroom than they care that there are three blue cubes in S in this turn. Now, I would be interested to hear from if anyone has ever run into players who have a problem with Flashpoint. Uh, it's a great game, as we've discussed before, but is it inappropriate for someone who suffered a loss to fire? Yeah, I could yeah. see it. If if uh, we'd love to hear if, if anyone out there has an experience, uh, it's you know it's just one of those things that you don't always necessarily think about. But uh, trigger warnings in board games could be a, uh, an issue. Yeah, I could definitely see it. I've yet to see that come up. I have seen people turned off from the theme. They're just like, yeah, firefighters. But I don't think it was anything about no right. trauma involved. Just the theme didn't catch them. Right. So, of course, I talked about how I love dexterity games, so I have a couple of them. Uh, the one I've already mentioned already, but I'm going to talk a bit more about it. The it, it, it has hooked more people on games for me than any other game in my collection. That's Hamster Roll. There's something about that big yellow wheel that catches people's interest. Now, one of the best parts about this game is that it requires actual strategy and that it's more important than the physical dexterity in the game. Like, these pieces are not hard to manipulate or hold. When placing pieces, it's the choice of what place to it, what piece is going to go where that matters more than steady hands. Uh, now, even I can teach this to, you know, this one to someone in a couple of minutes and yeah. then quickly watch their shock as, it, uh, yeah. as it's easy but not simple. And then the cursing comes shortly thereafter as the wheel doesn't roll how they expect and uh, everything goes horribly wrong. Now, my other big dexterity game is Pitch Car. Now, this is unique on this list just because it has worked for me to hook gamers when I wasn't even trying. 
we set this up at a local coffee shop and other times at a local bar and have had complete strangers come over and go, what are you guys doing? And then ask to play if they can play in the next round. Like I have gotten multiple people off the street basically to play kit pitch car with me. Now this is a flicking based race game where you make a track and players flick wooden crokinole style discs around the track. I love this game, but fair warning, it, it is not a cheap game. Though, to be fair, getting anyone hooked on games is somewhat cruel to the wallet, no matter what. Although, <laughs> if you follow at Tabletop underscore Deals on Twitter, it can get a little bit easier. Yeah, though, Deals on Pitch Car, if you were far between. They were there at uh, Boxing Day. I managed to pick up the last two expansions I didn't have. There we go. So now the last game on this list, which is in the pile behind me, was going to be Concept. I've talked about that a couple times in the last few shows, but uh, Deanna has convinced me to drop that in place of a better gateway game. Uh, something that's not a party game. I said I wanted to avoid light party games and have something where there's actual strategy. Well, I put Concept on the list, and well, that's a light party game. So sticking to my own rules, uh, we decided to go with Lanterns the Harvest Festival. Now this is another match the sides of the tile style game where you're playing a tile and if it matches the tile you get lanterns what's cool in this one is when you play a tile not only do you get the lanterns the resource in the game but so do all your opponents so the tile you play has four sides you get the color facing you but the player on your left gets the color facing them player across me gets the color facing them and the player to your right gets the color facing them so it's all about trying to get what you want without helping your competition too much along the way I have had fantastic success introducing this one to the local maker community at Hackforge Game Nights. Very solid game from uh, Renegade Games. So there you have it. 11 games, that's counting as well from before we got into the list of games, that I have personally used to hook new gamers into the hobby and have actually gotten people to come back and ask for more. Now we want to know what games have worked for you. What's your gateway game? Firing off an email to Mo or Sean at tabletopbellhop.com or get in touch on social media. All right, so we've had some uh, chat going on. Uh, Brian's wondering if uh, his daughter might like um, Takenoko. I would think so. Like yeah. it, it's it's I, it says thirteen plus because they're small pieces. They worry the kids are going to put in their mouths, not because of the difficulty of the game. Right. There is no actual reading required. Uh, it's all icons. It's actually a rather surprisingly simple game, but again, fairly deep strategy once you get into it. Uh -huh. I saw Poncho called out Hot Shots. Hot Shots is fighting forest fires. I have heard good things about that one. I have not tried it myself. There we go. Uh, and uh, Brian mentions his favorite gateway game for preschoolers is Hiss. Uh, uh, that one we skipped when my kids were young, so I haven't tried that one. Uh, actually, uh, today Reddit came up. Uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about dexterity games on Reddit. Uh, oddly enough, the, the number one game most people were going to was Crokinole. <laughs> It's gotten huge. Like, just in the last three years, this is something I didn't know growing up. I live in Ontario. Crokinole started here in Ontario, and most people in the U.S. had never heard of it. It just started getting out to, like, packs. I think it was, there was a couple people that started bringing boards to packs, and then it started to spread. And now a ton of podcasters I listen to now have Crokinole tournaments every year. That's I have true. to admit, it being a local game, I've never played. Like, yeah, we had the the 52 games in one board that was my dad's that had plastic pieces, yeah. but I don't remember ever actually trying to play Crokinole with it. It's on my list. Like I'm thinking if I can find a game at origins to try, there's a couple people I've been actually talking to. I don't want to get in a tournament or anything, but people I know who have boards also Chris Groff, who uh, we've talked about on the show a couple times is going to be at breakout con and he just got a new table. Oh. So I'm trying to convince him to bring it to breakout so we can play, but I get bringing a Crokinole board downtown Toronto may <laughs> not be, very feasible so yeah. maybe maybe there'll be a table in the board game room and we can all try it out i am curious i have heard from many people it's fantastic yeah uh it was also interesting though because a lot of the the board game hardcore people are that's not a board game that's a oh. dexterity game uh, but, uh, but yeah there's there's there were more than enough people who were <laughs> ignoring them and just carrying on mentioning uh some wonders uh a lot of people were saying or a couple of people voiced up um and said you know hamster roll if you're not being cutthroat Whoever goes first wins. Yeah, but why wouldn't you be cutthroat? That's well, that, was, that was my comment. I said, you know, like, 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 like if well, you're being you're nice, playing whoever, a game. Yeah, they, like, their, their comment was, uh, uh, if you're playing nice, whoever goes first wins. And I said, nice? What? Yeah, like, what, <laughs> what you're, you you're playing a game. Like, 
the, the Brian Kurtz has a question we're going to get to eventually about competition. That fits in well with that one because yeah. if, if I'm playing a board game, I play to win. Like I, I don't care who wins, but I am playing a game to win. I am going to try my hardest to win that game when I play. So yeah. that, that to me, the, the concept of if you're it's, – it's like when we play Carcassonne with my mom and she finishes other people's cities. Like just don't play yeah. Carcassonne with my mom. <laughs> like, it's not about being nice. That's yeah, why I mean, you need co-op dexterity games. Then you can be nice. Yeah, I mean, I you know, there's there's you don't have to be cruel, but you also no. I mean, you're 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 not gonna try and make it easy for them. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure in, in Hamster Roll, I try to be as cruel as possible. Well, yes, I mean, I've done in that. <laughs> that game in particular. Like, uh, interesting. That's yeah. amusing. Well, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other questions answered in blog form. Send us your questions on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, right now, patrons at the Good Tip or Better Level do get their questions bumped to the top of the question list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. the Queen's time, where they talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, good to see you stop by during Gloomhaven, and great to have you join us in the chat room this week. Duran Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks, Joe. Jeff Seuss, congrats on the new Hackforge location. William Fisher, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Mom. Danielle Thomas, thanks. Ah, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.